Okay, we are live. Um, hi, welcome to the webinar, um, Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. Welcome, Dr. Tolley. Well, like hello, busy, Laura. Busy hello, on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how's it going? Happy Friday. Happy We're spring. here. We're here. Yes. And it's March. St. Patty's it's Day's almost. over. Spring's here. All of this good stuff. Yes. And at yes. least in the U.S., we've already had lost the hour of sleep, so... I know. I think I'm still recovering from that spring forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, let's see. Well, we'll give people a couple minutes here. Oh, but less than a couple minutes. I'm sure we're gonna have lots of good questions today. Um, so can I throw a question out at you? That's kind of a random question. I just thought of now. Um, sure. Sure. So please, I, I joined please. the latest craze and I, I bought a weighted blanket because um, I thought it'd be really cool to help sleep like a weighted blanket. And mm -hmm. I was just thinking, like, you know, sometimes we buy these products and I'm wondering, like my dog, my weighted blanket's 15 pounds, for example, my dog's 18 pounds. So for pets, so some of these things you might not think of that could potentially be dangerous to them. Is that something like with, obviously if a weighted blanket is like laying on your bird or your dog or your rabbit or your ferret or whatever pet you have, something to consider? Do you see any weird uh, product? <laughs> yeah. Um one of the biggest my biggest uh uh concerns and and it's and it's the concerns of a number of uh, uh also um uh, bird owners um are are the the the, the toys that um, that are available uh to birds and um unfortunately there's no good housekeeping seal of approval uh for bird toys or anything of that you know, anything that you put in the cage uh, to entertain the, the birds. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many of the, the, the I guess, uh, just the, uh, whatever they put the, the toys together uh, with uh, um, are, um, uh, can be problematic um, with, with birds. And, and I've seen just about everything um put together to be a a bird toy and and there's plastic and there's uh <clears throat> there's cotton rope um that we've pulled out of the intestines of a um a gala cockatoo um that uh, unfortunately over a period of time didn't make it um, there's uh, and then I mentioned plastic uh, there's also uh, people put uh, electronic, um, you know, uh, inside, uh, you know, they, 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 the toy on the outside is not electronic, but it's something the bird can open, uh, or tear apart and get to the electronics within there. And you know, they, they sell that to put in the bird cages. And some of these are rather large for large macaws and, and cockatoos, uh, size because you surely wouldn't want to put a something that's you know uh you know uh, you know I, I don't know uh a foot long in the you know in a budgie cage yeah. and so it's it's made and and you assume that it's for a, a, a large bird and they can tear that apart and so uh that is one of the things i, I tell you laura that uh, really is uh is a concern um, and, and for the health, I, I, I purchased um, a, uh, a kind of a uh, kind of a interact, you know, kind of a foraging toy uh, for for my <clears throat> little Senegal, and I didn't realize that around the top of it there was a little plastic ring um, that uh, it, all around it was like uh, kind of a uh, fiber stuff that it could go in, you know, and tear apart, uh, kind of like the uh, finger traps that you can you can have, and 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 so the bird tears all of those apart, and and then then I notice at the top, then I notice that there's this plastic, and the bird's been chewing on it, you know, um, and and it was all lost in when when it was all together, you know. Uh, so, uh, I mean, some of it is even, even hidden when I'm looking for it, 
And, uh, but that's, uh, you bring up a good point. And I just want to make sure that people keep that in mind um, and think about what the bird may ingest or could ingest that uh, may uh, cause a blockage or, um, uh, you know, uh, within the, the, the intestinal tract. Yeah, that's a good point too to, to, to make sure that you, you, you pay attention to your bird's toys to check on the toy because sometimes when the bird plays the toy, you discover parts like that that, mm -hmm. you know, to inspect the toys, right? Yeah, 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 very much so. And uh, also you want to make sure that the, 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 the toy is appropriate for the size of the bird. They used to make, and, and I, thank goodness, I, I, I haven't seen them in a while, little like pelicans. Uh, they used to have a, a little toy uh, you know, uh, here in the United States called we, uh, weebles. And, and so the weevils wobble, but they don't fall down yes. uh, because they had a little, they had a rounded bottom. So you could knock them over and they'd come back up. And, and, and so they had a little pelican like that, where a little, about for a size of a budgie. Penguin too, yeah. Uh, a penguin. penguin, it was a penguin, yeah. not a pelican. It was a penguin. For, for budgie toys, that was a popular Yeah, you remember those? Yeah. And, and I think that uh, in, in, in a budgie wouldn't be able to, crack that open but oh well let's put let's buy this for the the amazon parrot or let's buy it for a gray or oh or, or even a, a larger cockatoo and of course you know that would that would go you know and and then there's that material at the bottom for weight on that little little and so they could ingest that in the foreign foreign body and and heavy metal toxicosis. So, because they'll scrape that off. But, but again, you want the, the point is that you want to make sure that the the toy that you actually uh, provide to the birds is is adequate for the size of the bird. You don't want to put a, a bird toy in naturally that's too big. Like I said, a block that this is that's this big for a cockatiel and it'll scare it. Um, but you don't want to put a cockatiel toy that's small in for a bigger, bigger bird. So that's that you want to be size appropriate with that. Good points. Good points. Um, there you go. There's some toy safety for y'all. Um, and before we, we're going to dive into some questions, um, just a reminder, use the Q&A button instead of the chat feature. That way we can uh, capture the questions uh, easier. So. Um, uh, so, Dr. Tolley, um, so if you're just joining us again, we're at the Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. And um, we already have a couple questions lined up for you, um, if you're ready for them. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, first question is about a um, budgie. Uh, so this is from Arlene. She says, I brought my two-year-old female um, blueberry to my vet for a checkup. Um, for her sear and a slightly plump uh, chest. Uh, the sear is crusty purplish brown and has been like that since I got her as a baby. Vet suspects it's hyper um, keratosis. Um, plumpness in the breast area appears to be a lymphoma, uh, a lymphoma and the vet says there's no fluid to withdraw and you could not consider surgery unless um, until it became a problem, which it might not. He seemed to think uh, there might be a possibility of a thyroid being involved. Um, and so uh, her bird is on seed and pellets, high grade brands, treats, um, and never overfed. Um, Blueberry is an active little budgie. Uh, his, his, uh, um, let's see. Oh, and the vet wants to bring, uh, wants her to bring him back in three to four months uh, to see what to do next. Um, and the vet also mentioned the possibility of adding, I'm going to might kill this word, uh, lethothyroxine, uh, to her water for the thyroid. Mm -hmm. And... They also did a gram stain and the results they're waiting on. Mm -hmm. So what they would like to know, what are they would like to know from you, Dr. Tolley, is uh, what your opinion is and um, if you can elaborate on the conditions, um, if you have any suggestions. Well, uh, it, it, it sounds like um, um, her, her, her veterinarian is uh, very thorough. Uh, and that is uh, it's excellent in uh, providing uh, good care for her bird. Um, oh, sorry. I have an update from Arlene because she's watching right now. Um, the gram stain came back as healthy. So. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Um, normal or negative is, is always good, you know? Um, 
And uh, as far as the 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 little and and I was going to uh, mention that it is a lipoma. Uh, Sorry, that, I'm, I said lymphoma. I'm she's uh -huh, yeah, lipoma you. and and the lipoma is just is and and, and I say. Uh, just a fatty tumor, but uh, they can be rather large and they can, um, they, they need to be uh, removed. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I just was uh, collecting blood on a, <clears throat> I believe it was a, uh, it was an Amazon, uh, about a, a 30 to 36 year old Amazon, which is not uncommon for lipomas in, in Amazon. Um, parrots, um, but they these were on the neck area, and 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 so uh, uh, for the most part they were um, uh, about a, a quarter of an inch in diameter, a centimeter uh, in diameter, um, and uh, one on the, the the top and one on the the bottom of the the. the the neck area, um, and they had been there for a number of years. So they can they can kind of remain in place these lipomas, uh, but they can also um, kind of distend and become uh, you know pendulous uh, actually, and need to be removed. And and I think that that's uh, one thing that I think your veterinarian is is looking and so making sure that it doesn't um, increase in size. Um, although uh, the um, the the possibility of a thyroid uh, issue is there, um, and 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 also it could uh, it is a budgie. It's it's kind of uh, interesting that. Uh, that you've had some of the, these issues, this hyperkeratosis, which usually doesn't develop uh, in budgies till an older age. Um, and, and it's only a two-year-old budgie uh, that uh, there may be some systemic uh, condition uh, going on. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the ability to, to definitively diagnose that um, is, is very, difficult in birds. And I think that there's uh, only a few one or so reports of specifically hypothyroidism in, in, in birds where you would need a thyroid supplementation. Although that there has been over many years, budgies have been um, uh, claims, there's claims in, in, in clinical uh, reports that they have had uh, enlarged thyroid glands. And, and this was all in the last decade when it was, there were, wasn't any, when you say you have your bird on pellets, you have pellets and where there's vitamins and minerals, including iodine, uh, that would be in the, in the, um, the formulation that would provide supplementation for proper thyroid function. Um, so uh, the, the situation is there's never, um, you never rule out that the possibility of there could be some developmental abnormality, uh, maybe affecting the thyroid here. And um, that is causing some of these, this uh, fatty tumor development at an early age, uh, went on a proper diet, the hyperkeratosis. Uh, I don't know if there's any feather um, discoloration or uh, just uh, structural abnormalities uh, with that, but that's also sometimes a clinical sign that's associated with uh, thyroid dysfunction. Um, but what what you're 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 looking at, your veterinarian is 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 monitoring this and associate you know, in in working uh, to to determine if there is a treatment that may be in place to try to reduce some of these clinical signs. Uh, one thing that I will say is that, uh, that in the past, there's been information that says that, well, if you put the birds on, on a uh, proper diet, that <clears throat> a lipoma or a fatty tumor will reduce in size, um, that, it, that you can kind of, have the, tu the, the, the tumor regress in size. And um, I'm not a, 
a uh, believer in that. I think if it, what you can do is possibly um, reduce the ability of that tumor to grow in size by placing it on a proper diet. Um, but um, as far as regressing and going away, um, just through proper diet, I, um, I think it would be a long time before something like that would occur. But but uh, nonetheless, um, that's, that's what I think about that uh, case. And, and the, the drug that you mentioned would be to, as a kind of a, a, a thyroid supplementation in the event of uh, uh, a lack thereof. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. And our next question comes from uh, Pat. Uh, they wanted to know what is the very best way to determine if um, if a bird has atherosclerosis. Um, they have the following species, and they want to know which which of these ones would be more inclined to develop it. They have cockatoos, a Moluccan and a Ele Eleonora, a red lord Amazon lovebirds, blue and gold macaw, and an eclectus. Which one of those, if any, would be more prone to um, atherosclerosis? Mm. Well, uh, first of all, atherosclerosis, just to make sure that everybody is aware of what we're, we're, we're talking about here is um, really uh, within the, the artery um, that um, in, in, in humans, uh, you get um, atherosclerosis and it, it, it primarily what you're seeing is that, and, and what it affects uh, is blockage of the coronary arteries or the arteries of the heart. So you have, when you're talking about cholesterol and you're talking about plaques within the, the coronary arteries that clog and that they have to use stents to, uh, to, to open them. And uh, also they do bypasses because they're so clogged that they need new vessels uh, to, to circulate the blood around the heart so you can live. Well, that's atherosclerosis. And in birds, um, what, uh, based on the information that, um, that we have at this time, um, that it, it affects the, the major vessels coming from the heart. Um, and, and, and so you're looking like at the aorta, the big major artery coming from the heart and the, the pulmonary <clears throat> artery and the pulmonary vein coming from the heart to the lungs. So major, major vessels there, but it can affect, <clears throat> it can affect other vessels. And Dr. Beaufrere, who's, um, who, um, who, who did uh, some of the, the, the first uh, research on this in birds, uh, in parrots, um, I would say parrots, um, that uh, he, he thinks that it possibly affects some of the coronary vessel vasculature too, but it, they're smaller in birds naturally than, than humans. And, um, and so that's atherosclerosis. Um, the, the issue that we have with this disease is it is very, it's common in birds as it is common in humans. Um, and, and with that, as the birds age, although uh, age doesn't have to have uh, everything to do with it, um, but uh, of course, the longer the birds are, are alive and, and, and if they are fed a, a high fat diet, that that increases their chances of, um, of, of uh, getting uh, this disease. A uh, problem we have as veterinarians is diagnosing this disease uh, before uh, the animal um, is, is uh, severely affected or dies. And we just can't uh, run a, uh, do, do uh, uh, studies where we can get uh, dye. Uh, we're, we're working to develop, and this is some of the research not necessarily we're doing here now, but others uh, to run dye into the vessels so you can identify uh, vessels that are uh, uh, that have uh, blockage. Now, the the question goes back to 
um, the birds that this gentleman has and which ones are more susceptible. I would say that in general, you have to consider um, all birds uh, susceptible to some degree, but some we see and are diagnosed more often. And there are, there are a few papers out there, one that Dr. Beaufrere and some of the pathologists that actually do the um, post-mortem examinations on these birds put together uh, to determine which birds were more uh, susceptible or not. But um, which, what birds did he list uh, on that? Uh, okay, so we have um, cockatoos, the Molucca and Eleanor. Cockatoo, Eleanora. a cockatoo. Um, we, uh, we don't uh, diagnose that as much in cockatoos as some of the other birds. What else? Um, we have red lore Amazon, lovebirds, blue and gold macaw, and eclectus. Well, in the Amazons, uh, that one is uh, one that is... Um, uh, more commonly diagnosed, atherosclerosis is more commonly diagnosed, uh, the macaw also, and uh, we've diagnosed that um, in uh, eclectus uh, also. Um, matter of fact, uh, I will say <clears throat> this is a situation in, in what makes uh, atherosclerosis um, such a, a uh, I guess, uh, significant disease is that uh, we had an eclectus um, not too, too long ago that came in for uh, a grooming. And uh, in, in the, uh, the eclectus came in for a grooming and it, it had uh, for, for, and has for a number of years and and during the uh, grooming um, procedure, um, it, uh, uh, it, it had, uh, it, the, the, the uh, nurse was holding it and it just, uh, um, it, it just passed away. And uh, that, you know, again, you go about grooming, you say, well, it's, it's not, not a, um, uh, a, a serious, uh, you know, it's grooming, it's easy, it's, there's nothing wrong, but there, um, you know, the bird is uh, under a little, little stress, and I would say that birds just don't like uh, die, uh, you know, just have, uh, have a heart attack in a sense, like just due to stress. Um, they could have a heart attack due to atherosclerosis or a disease condition, but uh, for the most part, birds just don't up and ah, I'm I, I, I'm 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 dead. Um, and uh, it, especially when you're going through a procedure that's so, what you would say, um, so minor, a minor procedure where there's not not anything involved with it. Um, but uh, you 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 know, there's always the chance that there is a a condition that may, may uh, cause a, uh, a serious reaction. And, uh, and this, this, uh, this bird, in the end, what we found, uh, talking to the owner, the bird had, you know, it, she said, well, it was just, uh, you know, it was doing okay, um, but it was a little bit, uh, 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 maybe uh, not as active as it, as it had been, but nothing, uh, significant, nothing that somebody would say, um, but we did get a post-mortem exam and it did have severe significant atherosclerosis. Um, and, and so this is something that uh, even in, a, in a, a, a grooming procedure, you wanna make sure that we sedate the birds and we do everything possible um, to, to reduce the stress of of some of the, even the minor procedures uh, with birds, but with something so, uh, you know, you can have these hidden disease conditions uh, that always is something that is uh, unknown. Um, and atherosclerosis is one of them. So eclectus uh, can, African grays, African grays are another uh, species 
uh, and many people may have African grays, but that's another species that is, um, uh, I guess, uh, predisposed uh, to atherosclerosis. And, um, and just like humans with cholesterol, high cholesterol, you can feed them a good diet, but it, it, it's going to reduce the incidence and possibly onset of the disease, but it, it's not going to prevent it. Okay, wow. Um, let's see, our uh, next question comes from Anne. Um, she wants to know what research is being done to find a cure or effective treatment for avian gastric yeast? Oh, well, there is um, a significant, uh, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say significant because there's only so much uh, research, but most of the research uh, that's being done um, right now is, first of all, to try to, well, uh, you can, where's the cart and where's the horse here, you know, uh, there was uh, just a uh, paper from uh, Australia uh, Dr. David Phelan has done quite a bit of work with uh, avian gastric yeast and his team down, down there. Um, and they have come uh, out with a kind of a, a uh, <clears throat> looking for diagnostics. What's a good way to diagnose it? Uh, and so that's one, one area. And, uh, and then also uh, trying to determine what the uh, effective treatment um, people are, and I'm not sure actually who's doing uh, the research where, but I know that there are people that are trying to find a more effective uh, treatment for avian gastric yeast. One of the problems that you have is that it's a fungal type organism, right? And, uh, and when you have uh, an infectious disease when you have a fungal disease uh, that it's a serious condition and very difficult to treat, very difficult to treat. Um, and this is a, a disease condition that um, birds can be a sub, you know, subclinical, animals can't get symptoms, but uh, subclinical and uh, in, and so we can pass it on and maintain it within a, a, uh, um, a group of birds, an aviary. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to be able to diagnose. You would want to know if the birds are, are subclinical carriers, if they're carrying it, but they're not showing any disease signs. And so therefore you can uh, say, oh, this bird, has the organism and I don't want to include it in my aviary. So uh, being able to um, identify birds that are, are like this is a very, very good way to, to try to get, it, get rid of it if you can identify those. So research is being done for diagnostics, I know, and uh, also to try to find an effective treatment and with the medications and therapeutics that we have, um, that's what in, in veterinary medicine, it's not like uh, we have the resources to try to develop new therapeutics. It's trying to find the therapeutics that are commercially available that we can use that are in, in, in either a cocktail or or how we can administer that, um, that would be effective. Okay, and, and actually, what would, how would a bird present that, that is showing signs of avian gastric yeast infection? Uh, those, and, and usually it's, it's budgies uh, that we see this in uh, quite a bit, uh, in, in primarily. And, and, but it can, it can affect other birds too. And you can have uh, in, um, GI signs, uh, you can have uh, uh, really, uh, the birds can be regurgitating, okay? Uh, you can have uh, a, uh, uh, affect the, the, uh, the, 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 the fecal material, you could have uh, diarrhea. Um, and uh, with the uh, avian gastric yeast, 
and also uh, one of the the <clears throat> that means that the vent around the vent can be a little uh, soiled where it should be uh, nice and uh, you know where you don't see any fecal material or urine on that uh, around the the feathers of that vent and 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 often the owners will say the birds are going light the birds are going light and and, and of course many people know that that just means they're thin uh, very thin birds and so you have a thin bird that's regurgitating those are some of the common clinical signs that are associated uh, with this, uh, this disease. Oh, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Marquetta. And they ask, hello, I would like to ask, what are the most common causes of poisoning or toxicities in birds? What are the most common causes of toxicity in birds? Or poisoning, yeah. In poisons. Um, I, would, I would have to say, that um, I like the question. I like all of the questions. Uh, it kind of makes you think a little bit. Um, all of them do. Yeah. But uh, when, when we're looking at the, the common uh, toxicities, lead, um, heavy metal toxicity is probably uh, the most common in parrots because they bite and chew. And um, in, in lead is so innocuous it's 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 everywhere or you can say ubiquitous within the environment that you don't really realize what lead is or what what's involved or people don't realize what they they're they're actually doing um, in exposing their birds to lead or zinc zinc is another one zinc is a, a micronutrient and of course you can find tablets where zinc is going to promote your immune system and, and, and help reduce your chances of getting uh, viral infections or colds or what have you. So you can see where that, that's in there. But just like anything else uh, with zinc, a little bit is, is good, a lot is not. Just mm -hmm. like, like I always say brownies you know, a brownie or two, if you like, you know, is good, but, you know, a, a truckload of brownies would be too much <laughs> chocolate toxicity. <laughs> and, and so we, and, and, and of course, uh, the, you know, chocolate has been uh, one that uh, has, uh, you know, is known to be a, a, a toxin in, in animals. Um, but uh, that's, we don't, I don't uh, have never diagnosed that in birds and really don't recommend people feeding chocolate to their birds. Um, and um, we did, we haven't, uh, thank goodness, we haven't seen avocado toxicity, although that's, that's, that's highly uh, known about. Um, and uh, so heavy metal, I, I guess, would be the, the main thing uh, in, in companion birds that, that we see toxic wise. What about um, nonstick cookware? Is that something that would fall in? Yeah, well? and then we, as far as that isn't ingested, um, uh, smoke or some type of an environmental toxin. Um, and thank you, Laura, for that, because that's a whole nother area. Um, where you have an environmental toxin, where you have a, a respiratory um, toxicosis and, and, and really uh, affects the, the pulmonary uh, uh, tissues and, 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 and will kill a bird through, through that. And that's the nonstick uh, cookware. Um, but uh, any smoke inhalation is, is very problematic for birds. And, and of course, um, and we all know about the canaries and the coal mines, the canaries, if the canary was there and uh, in the coal mine and you kept the, if the canary was uh, happy and, and, and still alive, that's good. But if the canary was dead, you better get out because of uh, uh, toxic gases within the coal mine, whether methane or some, some other gas that that the humans uh, could could not smell uh, within that 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 environment, but 
but the bird's respiratory system is so sensitive and and so they're going to be much more susceptible to environmental toxins within the atmosphere than humans and and that that of course goes for nonstick cookware smoke uh, is another and then uh, of any type and then also uh, you have to be careful with the uh, plug-in air fresheners uh, we have had uh, birds that have had respiratory uh, distress and, and, and come in with clinical signs of respiratory illness because of the plug-in air, air fresheners uh, that you, you put the air, air freshener in. And so you have to be very careful about anything of that like that. Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Rose wanted to know, do you have any updates um, on ongoing vaccine trials for P PBFD? No, 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 uh, the, uh, and there will not be any um, because uh, anything that is scientifically validated and will have USDA and within the United States um, have uh, USDA approval, uh, there's no company that will um, actually, um, I guess, uh, pay the money for that uh, approval to occur because it'll cost uh, upwards, uh, according to Dr. Ritchie, who's had the PVFD vaccine for a number of years now and is very familiar with the FDA or USDA approval, FD, you know, USDA approval of the vaccine. Um, it takes uh, upwards of a million dollars or so or two and and in and, uh, and the company uh, for commercial production and to do all of that would have to uh, invest that into that vaccine. And um, the return on actually having a commercially available vaccine is um, not there. Uh, because if you look at the vaccines that are available for poultry, um, they're uh, pennies on the dollar. Okay, so, so if we say um, you have a Merrick's disease vaccine, I don't know what it costs, but I'm sure that it's probably less than 10 cents a, a dose. It probably may be less than five cents a dose, I'm not sure. But how many chickens do they vaccinate? You know, it's a 40 to $45 billion a year industry in the United States, poultry. OK, so they're going to make the money on those vaccines with the number of birds that are produced every year, even if it's five cents a, a dose, they're going to make millions of dollars. But uh, when you look at uh, trying to make uh, a return on an investment on a, uh, a vaccine for companion avian species uh, with the number of doses that that would be provided, then you would be looking at a vaccine like the polyoma vaccine, for instance, which was or is commercially available. And, and you go like, well, gosh, that's like $30 a dose, let's just say. And then somebody's gonna say, ah, you know, how many people are gonna vaccinate their birds at $30 a dose? Not many, you see. And so the, the, you know, for don't look for any avian vaccines other than the ones that are available uh, uh, that are USDA approved and that are scientifically validated. I, you know, I can come up with a bunch of vaccines with in, 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 in my garage and start selling them tomorrow, you know, but there's no scientific validity to that. And, uh, and, and there's just not gonna be the vaccine police coming to shut me down before I sell them for two or three years that they're not gonna do anything. So um, unless it comes from a reputable source, somebody that usually is associated with some type of a, um, a scientific research laboratory, um, then um, they're, you know, I, I wouldn't have any faith in utilizing them uh, at all. And the only ones that I'm, I'm aware of is the, the polyomavirus vaccine. 
that uh, is 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 available, and uh, it, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, Rico, who's Dr. Soga in, from Japan, asks: um, Are there any scary uh, pathogenic bacteria, such as human bacteria? Um, and they put in parentheses. I'm going to read this out loud. Hopefully, it's a uh, full. Fulminant hemolytic steptococcus, caucus, caucus in birds. Sorry, I don't know if you could see that. Um, yeah, there, yeah, I, I, I uh, um, <clears throat> and so is there any, um, any human bacteria, did you say? Yeah, um, they want to know, I, I guess they're using that as an example. Um, if there's any uh, a, a pathogenic bacteria that's probably potentially affect birds, and they use as an example as the human bacteria. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, you, as as far as uh, the pathogenic uh, bacteria in birds, uh, this gets to the point of um, uh, I, I I I don't like. Um, pathogenic bacteria. I'm just going to say that out front. I don't like them. Okay. Um, and, and so um, the one thing that has, 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 I've learned over the years is that you, you never, you never know what's pathogenic or not uh, until it starts actually, uh, it, it, you know, until you identify it associated with a disease condition. So um, th that's why it's so important to get a culture and sensitivity. And with the, uh, the, the, the uh, culture and sensitivity, uh, you get a, the isolation of the bacteria and of course the appropriate um, treatment. Uh, so so that's, that's the w one thing that I, I, I wanna kind of emphasize um, because you, you never know what type of bacteria may be causing disease. And, and, and so is there a, a single pathogen that is more problematic or more serious or severe than another? Uh, I, I, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head that, that, that would be. Um, because I've seen severe disease caused by an, a number of different pathogens. And I've seen uh, bacteria that uh, you would consider, oh, this is a really bad pathogen, be resistant in causing disease, but be resistant to a number of what you would consider um, really good antibiotic therapy uh, or, or, or uh, medications. And, um, but uh, often uh, some of these are very sensitive or it's a very effective to treat uh, with uh, many of the common bacteria, I mean, antibiotic medications in which the more you would say, the more uh, that you, uh, the more um, effective or, or you'd say, these are the ones that I save for the hard cases. Um, that these these organisms would be resistant to, but they will not be resistant to the ones that are more common. So you never know, which is uh, always uh, why I think it's important if you have a a uh, possible bacterial infection that culture and sensitivity is um, is extremely important. So you can make sure you identify what the cause is and then also what the proper treatment is. But as far as one uh, organism that say, oh man, this is, Daddy. yeah. yeah. But, you know, uh, I think the possibility is that they all can be. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and then Sharon wanted to know is, why do so many birds uh, suddenly have a seizure or stroke and then die immediately? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like that. And, and, and I like, you know, I like the question, but you know, I, I would say, you know, you say, why do so many birds, so many 
have a seizure and stroke and die immediately. That that is the question in itself um, implies that there's a lot of birds that do that, and it doesn't happen here. <laughs> you know, I gave you an instance of one that just that that died. Uh, you know, suddenly. Uh, not even struggling, just kind of mouthing a towel uh, during a, a nail tr nail trim, uh, and then the nurse who says <laughs> it's not, you know, and 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 so that's very rare, and 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 I and I would hope that the 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 seizure or the the uh, or suddenly sudden death is is a rare occurrence often <clears throat> when what you what what i i always try to tell the students and i try, try to tell the veterinarians in training is that when when the birds come to the hospital or go to the doctor that they there's usually something wrong mm -hmm. it's not like these birds that are, are that suddenly die um, die because we don't know what it is. Um, and so usually there is a condition that is causing the birds to 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 if they do suddenly die or have a seizure, there's something that is wrong in causing that. Um, and 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 so <clears throat> what um, and and we find out what that that is uh, in, in in a number of cases, and sometimes when, like this, the the bird that I had described um, was coming in just for grooming and died. Then what that you know what I always say in that when there's something unusual like that that occurs, yeah, that. You, if you do a necropsy or a post-mortem exam, 99% of the time you will find out why that occurred. 99%. There's a 1% chance, hey, it just happened. But just like this bird that I had described, it had severe cardiovascular disease. And, 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 and as birds age, as they get older, as we're able to maintain them on good diets and they're living into their prime and up to their, their, the age that is uh, average for uh, captivity, then you are going to start seeing these geriatric disease conditions like we are now. Like I saw this 30, 36 year old blue front Amazon the other day. And now that bird, uh, again, uh, you know, have, have to mention to the owner of the age and the condition, um, but the, uh, the, the birds that sudden have seizures or suddenly die, um, the reason that happens is because there's a disease condition that's causing that. And what you have to do in those cases uh, within a uh, in, in, while you're in, in a, examining them in a medical center is make sure that you reduce the stress as much as possible. That includes sedation and do the procedures as expeditiously as possible so that the animals have the least amount of, um, uh, as I mentioned, stress that may cause a, uh, um, any um, adverse event, like as uh, you know, an adverse event could be a seizure. It could, it, it could, it could be death. But um, uh, that's that's the the answer to to that basically. Okay, uh, and then Frank wanted uh, to know um, a four year old. We're talking about a four year old blue front um, Amazon. Uh, Barbers, uh, Barbers. Uh, a four-year-old, sorry. Four-year-old yeah. blue front. Yeah, a four-year-old blue front. Barber's feathers about an inch above each leg and below the wings for about the last 15 months. Um, could this be a nervous condition or is there a possible medical cause? 
a nervous condition or a like an under like a medical cause could it be oh uh, yeah yeah both it could be um it's just like the um the macaw we we saw yesterday um in that uh it, it is an older macaw um but uh you you always want to uh make sure that you you look and and try to rule out any medical um condition that may be underlying that but it if if all of the if there's nothing uh and when i say medical something that kind of a disease condition uh that uh would be uh associated with that um infectious disease or 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 anything that you can uh actually test for that's what you would want to do first uh parasites uh which is really uncommon or rare but they can occur um in 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 citizen species depending on what the history and where the bird has been um but you want to rule out medical is is first because if it is medical and you can treat it then that's nice that's that's something that you can resolve right away um but if it is not medical uh then it's a behavioral issue then that's a whole other ball game and then you have to start looking at uh, nutrition. You have to start uh, looking at environment. You have to start looking at some other other factors there um, that may be um, associated with behavioral. Uh, and that's why uh, everything's uh, being done as far as promoting uh, uh, psychological stimulation. Uh, as I mentioned, like the toys or a foraging diets and things of this nature um, to uh, to try to uh, stimulate the general environment of the of the bird. Um, but um, that, you know, the the environment uh, is, is, is involves many things. And that's where uh, Chris Davis is on there here. She can uh, go into all of that. Uh, I, I mean, um, but, uh, but no, it can be either one, but you want to really rule out the medical and get a kind of an idea on what the general health of the bird is, uh, before you go off into that, uh, for the lack of a better word or two words, rabbit hole of behavior issues, because it, um, as it, it, with any animal or human, uh, they are difficult to treat. They're difficult to treat. All right, and then Mary um, has a 21-year-old uh, female eclectus uh, that is a hormonal all the time. Um, she has been giving three shots, but it didn't work. So do you have any suggestions for her highly hormonal female eclectus? Uh, and when, I, when, when, she, when she says three, three shots, um, I'm not sure what that uh, entails, um, but uh, the 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 one thing that i would suggest is that she didn't say implant um and if she believes that it is is hormonal uh in nature and and we have had issues and um over you know uh, and it always seems we have an example but we've had issues with uh egg bound eclectus recently and 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 issues with with uh, the hormonal aspects of uh, the uh, eclectus, but uh, the Lupron, uh, an injection, uh, even if it was a Lupron injection, I would, I would say, uh, I, would, I would try to maybe su you know, suggest uh, asking about an implant um, that would be uh, releasing uh, the, the medication um to to reduce the hormonal activity uh in in that bird as opposed to the injection okay and then um carmen uh, asks is it um of clinical significance uh, a, pro a profuse growth of an e coli from a nose flesh and a six-month-old amazon um you know i i would be somewhat um 
I, I would be somewhat concerned because uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say that you would see a significant amount of E. coli um, within the uh, upper respiratory system of a parrot. Um, you know, you may see uh, E. coli in the GI tract, but it shouldn't be a, a significant. Uh, population of E. coli within the GI tract of a parrot, but if the if the bird is uh, actually showing clinical signs of respiratory disease, uh, then this is the the only isolate that they they actually receive. You know they uh, they were able to grow from that nasal flush. Then uh, then I would say uh, that that would be an indication that there is the, the, the possibility of um, that being the um, pathogen uh, that may be causing the clinical disease signs. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, again, it would be somewhat dependent on the amount of growth that was there because then depending on how they did the, the nasal flush, um, because you can, you can do a coanal swab um, in the dorsal aspect of the, of the mouth. And, and, and that's where the, the, the respiratory system interfaces with the oral cavity. Now, naturally, if you put a swab in the oral cavity, you could get, you know, kind of a E. coli contaminant and it, it's not there. Uh, sometimes you can put the swab there and flush through and have the, the flush go over the swab while it's in the co coena, and you can still get a contaminant of an E. coli. Um, did they, did they uh, just, just get a, a syringe and, and, and suction uh, material out of the nares? possible contamination there. Now, if you did a nasal lavage, if you put a needle into the infraorbital sinus uh, and flushed in sterile uh, saline <clears throat> and actually withdrew that directly from the sinus, then that is a better chance of getting a, um, a, a true sample of what the, the pathogen is. So depending on how that had, had that, the, 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 the number of organisms that were, were isolated, number of colonies and the, uh, how the sample was obtained um, have, have a lot to do with whether that is the, uh, indeed the pathogen, but um, it is possible that it could be uh, causing the disease condition and would need to be treated appropriately. And as with any parrot with upper respiratory disease, this is very complex. The sinuses are very complex and uh, appropriate aggressive treatment uh, is necessary to get uh, a resolution um, um, in a, in a quick manner, just given oral medication, in most cases, it's is is uh, it's difficult to resolve those upper respiratory conditions. Sometimes you need to actually we've used uh, infant bulb syringes to actually suction suction the mucus from the nares of the of the birds because um, if you're using a nasal flush or you're using nebulization, like uh, vaporization, and having uh, the uh, antibiotic go into the sinuses, um, that the mucus, of course, will block that from being treated. And so that is one of the, uh, the, the means of trying to get the mucus out of the, 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 uh, the at least the, the front, uh, front areas of the of the sinus and the nares. Wow. Okay. And then we, <laughs> it's very complicated. And then we have a question from Rose. Um, 
Okay, hopefully I won't kill any words here. Uh, do you consider um, enrofloxacin a toxic medication after five days on the prescribed dosage per weight? And second part of the question is, does it depend on the immune system or the fluoroquinolone side effects? A uh, couple of things. I uh, consider um, uh, uh, enrofloxacin or Batril uh, to be a, uh, an effective antibiotic, uh, just like um, I can get the carpenter formulary and there's about uh, 50 effective antibiotics that, um, or more uh, that are out there. And, uh, and, and the antibiotics I, I, I consider it a, a effective uh, uh, when used appropriately um, and uh, against the organisms that uh, it's most effective for. I've seen organisms that are quite resistant to uh, enrofloxacin or ciprofloxacin um, that uh, are a couple of the fluoroquinolones that, that we use. Um, but uh, used at the appropriate dose uh, I, in, in, uh, in, uh, in birds, I've, uh, I, you know, um, in, in, in the uh, appropriate manner um, for uh, the appropriate uh, to treat uh, a disease condition that it's best to be used for. I don't consider it toxic after five days. Uh, you know, um, uh, as with any, any drug that uh, we administer or we prescribe, uh, you, can, you can have an adverse reaction to any drug after the first administration. Uh, it could be toxic. And, and I guess, time out, time out, Laura. <laughs> All medications are toxic. How about that? From day one, they're toxic. All right. All medications are toxic. All right. And so then you say, well, if all medications are toxic, then why do you prescribe them? Why? <laughs> why? When the good outweighs the bad. We have a lot of commercials on TV now. It seems like all commercials are medications, right? And so when you when you see that when we have these commercials on medications, they are they are recommending this medication for one one issue. But at the end of the commercial, they list all of these side effects, significant side effects, multiple side effects, many side effects but they're only treating one thing, but they have all these side effects or potential side effects, toxicity, right? Yeah. And so that is why we don't wake up in the morning and say, Hey, look, man, we may get a, we may get an infection today, a bacterial infection. Let me pop a few antibiotics, you know? And, and so this is one of the things with medication. They're all, they all have side effects. So they're all toxic. Yeah. you know, think chemotherapy. Why would anybody do chemotherapy? Hair falls out, you know, the good outweighs the bad. And so, uh, and, and if you have any adverse side effects with medication, you need to stop. And so that's a great question. All of these have been excellent questions, but it, 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 it brings home a point uh, that everybody should should know. And the only reason we prescribe medication is when the good outweighs the bad and for the period of time so it can resolve. And what does the most work? The immune system. The immune system does the most work. If you don't have an immune system or if it is not functioning, that's why the animal needs to be, uh, or you, need to be psychologically um, you know, uh, in, in a good state of mind. You need to be uh, getting the nutrients. You need to be as stable as possible. You need to be hydrated. You need to make sure that you're doing everything. So all of you, uh, all of the animal is working to fight the, the, the disease condition. 
if 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 the animal is immunosuppressed, then that is making it more difficult for the the significant but minor in relation to what the immune system's doing ability of that drug to to uh, do its work and resolve the the problem. So so building up that animal's immune system is 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 as important as treating that the the uh the bird uh for it to to recover uh so the immune system is doing most of the work you know 90 percent or more um and but the significance of that if you don't have that drug it it wouldn't be able to to uh resolve the condition you could die from it but uh but it, it's it needs to be there and that's that's what it's uh, uh the most important on that and also making sure that the drug is getting in to the patient at the appropriate dose <laughs> for the appropriate length of time but if any time there is an adverse reaction uh, then, then, then please discontinue and consult uh, your veterinarian uh, to re redirect or reassess. Okay, those are good words of wisdom. Um, so uh, <laughs> we answered a lot of really good questions today, and we have a, we had a lot of questions uh, to go, but hopefully we'll get to some of those. Um, uh, we'll see you back here in April, I believe. End of April, we'll have you back on uh, with another Ask the Vet. Um, so before we go, I am going a couple things. I wanted to announce today's winner um, of the, our giveaway, which is the Lefebvre Tropical Fruit Pellets and a bag of Lefebvre Food of your bird's choice. Um, and that today is going to go out to Marguerite F. So Marguerite, congratulations. Um, Lefebvre office will reach out to you next week to send that out to you. Um, Dr. Tolley, we have someone saying thank you so much for your help and your advice. It's excellent. As always, we all appreciate what you do for the bird community. And with these questions and answers so well thank you so much laura and thank brenda and lefebvre for if, if it wasn't for for everybody involved here uh, we wouldn't have this and of course uh everybody that uh, uh you know views uh and and i just logs in for the the webinars uh the questions are fantastic uh it brings home some excellent points and it's it's something that i think that uh we all learn i learn um and and uh try to uh try to uh make sure that uh some of the uh Im important uh aspects of uh what we try to get across and and uh, to try to make sure that uh, our, our birds are um, uh, happy, healthy, and live long lives. So, so I appreciate all the questions and, and uh, the attendance and, and uh, yeah. your help. Yay, okay, so uh, thank you. Um, and just a reminder that we, we don't have a webinar next Friday because it's uh, spring break. So hopefully everyone's gonna enjoy a nice spring break. Uh, but we, we are going to put in our newsletter, um, our webinar newsletter, some suggested viewing options uh, of our past webinars. So make sure you check out the um, webinar newsletter for that. Um, and then when we re resume on Friday, April 9th, we're going to be with, uh, with Lisa Bono. She's going to be talking about the Gray Way. Um, it's going to be the Gray Way Adoption and New Start. So something to look forward to when we come back. And um, Dr. Tolley, once again, thank you. And we will see you uh, at the end of April, I believe. So yeah, and and uh, yes, and and I know that Dr. Soga is in Japan. So it's maybe a little late there in Japan. And I know maybe some of the South Alabama Bird Club are, are here. So I always want to say hello yeah. to, to them and uh, yeah, a little shout out there. There you go. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's very All right. Yes. All right. Everyone have a great weekend. Um, so everyone stay safe and all the best to you and your flock until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Easter. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. You too.